Hello and welcome to the first of a two-part lecture on the Warren Court, arguably the most important court of the 20th century and one of the two most important courts in American history. The Marshall Court of the early 1800s is one of those two. It covers two of the required cases in the AP government course. The Warren Court will include five of the required cases. Earl Warren was Chief Justice from 1953 until 1969 and presided over what most political scientists and historians call a constitutional revolution. He was a Republican appointed by Dwight David Eisenhower. Previously, he had been governor of California for a decade and he oversaw the um, detention of Japanese Americans in internment in California. And he had been the vice presidential candidate with Thomas Dewey in 1948. So he was a long and powerful uh, person in the Republican Party. He actually ran in 1952 for the nomination to be the Republican candidate, lost to Dwight Eisenhower. When Eisenhower won the election, he offered or thought of offering Warren a bit of a consolation prize to nominate him as Solicitor General to argue on behalf of the government in front of the court. Just before uh, Eisenhower was to give that nomination, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Vinson, died. And Eisenhower then slotted Warren in to be Chief Justice. Warren would become the last person to go directly from elected political office to that position. That decision will alter American history. Earl Warren would come to a court with eight other members who were not that in favor of applying federal power to the cause of civil rights. But Warren himself would be a devotee and activist for that. Interestingly, in 1955, Warren was still one of the most popular Republicans and Dwight Eisenhower considered stepping down after one term to allow Warren to run for president. Warren made it clear that he would not resign as Chief Justice. But a split would develop between Eisenhower and Warren. And at one point, Eisenhower uh, made the comment that appointing Warren was the biggest damn fool mistake I ever made. In fact, during the mid 50s, there were efforts to impeach Warren. They didn't achieve a majority, uh, a majority of the public. These efforts were inspired by the John Birch Society, a relatively new and fairly radical far right group that was primarily concerned about communism uh, spreading in America and a sense that the uh, anti-Christian movement would dominate America. Scholars Jeffrey Stone and David Strauss in January of 2020 published a book, Democracy and Equality, that assesses the Warren Court. And in their judgment, there are two strands that dominate the court, democracy and equality. What they're looking at here is the Warren Court will apply a doctrine that I'd mentioned before. That doctrine was the footnote four in the Caroline Products case from 1938, in which uh, Justice Stone's footnote argues that there is a time for a court to be more activist. That time is when one of two issues are endangered democracy and equality. And the court is to be activist. It's to be much like Charles Sumner said, the custodian of freedom. When those principles, democracy and equality are endangered by majoritarian power or majoritarian abuse. So to a great degree, that's what the Warren Court was, protecting people from majoritarian abuse. In some ways, that goes back to the Madisonian interest. The rest of the lecture, I want to cover eight topics, eight themes of the Warren Court. So we begin with what clearly is the, the principal base of it, the decision of Brown versus the Board of Education, one of the five required cases in the AP Gov course. This case brings together five separate court cases here. And it would be argued by the incredibly eloquent and powerful attorney, Thurgood Marshall. Marshall was the lead attorney for the NAACP from 1938 until 1961. During those 23 years, he argued 32 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court 
winning 29 of them. And in doing that, I think you can accept and understand the statement by scholar Michael O'Donnell. If Martin Luther King was the moral and spiritual leader of the civil rights movement, Marshall was its general, and he wanted results. Instead of making speeches, he made law. Marshall would come to the case with decades of experience challenging segregated schooling. He started and the NAACP, NAACP started at graduate schools and colleges, but then came to the K through 12 system. And in the case of Brown, they would shift away from an approach that was to have equal funding to essentially stay within the parameters of the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, separate but equal. And Spotswood Robinson, one of his co-counsels, took the advice that he had heard maybe a decade earlier from Polly Murray, one of his law school students, to try and challenge the entirety of Jim Crow rather than just equality of funding. And in doing this, Marshall would rely on the work of Kenneth Clark, the psychologist who performed this, the Dahl studies. And in, in looking at this to understand how the large system of racialized schooling and the whole system of Jim Crow infected and determined attitudes between whites and black, blacks about what's, who and what is supreme and what is inferior. And so this study leads in part to the final decision of the Brown court that not only suggests that the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause is violated by de jure legal segregation, but if you look at part of the written opinion there, that the inferiority of a group is created here. Now in the Plessy decision, the Supreme Court majority opinion argued that any sense, any badge of inferiority is not from law. It's from the belief of the person saying, I am inferior by being separate here. The Warren court flips that argument. It says the system itself imprints a badge of inferiority. There's going to be a theme here that goes throughout the Warren court about the system doing this, but it cannot be sanctioned by law. So this this decision is a critical one because it reverses about 80 years of court decisions that did not apply the 14th Amendment. So if you think back, we, we studied in the 1870s and 80s, the Supreme Court had argued that the state and the state alone will determine uh, civil rights. So education is not an enumerated right, but the 14th uh, Amendment's Equal Protection Clause will for the first substantial time be applied writ large to American schooling. In doing that, the court also overturns or stops the, the, the process of stare decisis that we've mentioned. The idea that respect for precedent. That idea will inform the rest of the court. It also, though, is challenged in question because of the use of psychology. And I see this as akin to Louis Brandeis's use of sociology in the Mueller decision and the Mueller argument that he, he, he made there. Now, the Warren court goes beyond Brown versus the board. The cases you see on the screen, Bowling v. Sharp was argued the same day and decided the same day, rather, as, as Brown won. Bowling v. Sharp dealt with one of those five cases, specifically the case in Washington, D.C. And because of that, it couldn't apply the 14th Amendment because the 14th Amendment applies to states, not to Congress. So instead, Warren looked at the Fifth Amendment and Due Process Clause. And he cites then this concept that we've mentioned, the liberty argument. And it's a defense really of the guarantee of liberty. That liberty has been a central part of American history. In 1905, we expanded it with economic liberty. But that idea is a, a, a sense of almost like the reverse incorporation. In some ways, you can see Bowl, Bowling versus Sharp, along with Brown v. the Board, akin to the Heller and McDonald decisions. What applies in D.C. is distinct and different than what applies to states. And so we have two different decisions there. Brown too would be argued one year later, brings the litigants back to the court, and they're asking the, the question about when do we integrate? In that decision, it was interesting because the NAACP wanted it immediately, September of 1955. Earl Warren had a vision 
that was broad and large. He envisioned an actual uh, different system, one that would have integration more than sort of shifting kids. So he thought it would take quite a while to redraw district lines, to bring communities into one that was an integrated setting here. And so in the Brown II decision, he writes a phrase that would become problematic with all deliberate speed. It's understandable on one hand, for a massive change you want to offer time, but it enables a slow process here. And we'll see that process play out over time here. The decision in Cooper v. Aaron involves this case, the case of the Little Rock Nine. The Little Rock Nine, those nine young African-American students that were the first to challenge uh, Little Rock Central High School would become famous throughout the country. In the case of Cooper v. Aaron, the, uh, the Supreme Court of Arkansas determined that their state did not have to abide by federal law. In part, the governor and the court had argued that the decision in Brown only applied to those cases before the court, didn't apply nationally, and they could choose to follow their state law. The court in Cooper v. Aaron chose to argue that the Sixth Amendment, the Article VI Supremacy Clause applied, and it rejected the state of Arkansas's position there. Now, this, the Little Rock uh, Nine case comes out in an interesting way because places throughout the South did choose to integrate. Arkansas had three of them, Hoxie being, in my mind, the most famous. But small communities willingly integrated, and essentially they argued the winds of change are here. Perhaps because of that, you saw a backlash of anger by a smaller group of racist whites that pushed the governor and other people to resist. Those elements start to create the backlash that happens. In 1956, it's known as the Southern Manifesto, and it happens in various ways. For example, in Little Rock, Arkansas, forced to integrate for that first year with the power of the federal government, at the end of that year, Little Rock closed its schools for an entire year. Rather than having a public school that was integrated, they would have no public schools. In Prince Edward County, Virginia below, they closed their schools for five full years. Where does one go to school if your schools are closed? Well, this leads to the emergence of numerous private academies throughout southern states. Those private academies were not covered under the Brown decision. So how do you then get folks who can't afford to pay for private academies to attend them? Well, in the state of Virginia for those five years, they offered a, a kickback on their property taxes. If you go to a private school, you got a 25% reduction in your property taxes. Effectively, in 1964, in the case of Griffin versus uh, Prince Edward County. The court invalidates that. You can, that is effectively a side door way to funding a private school system. But imagine how much damage that did. For five years, African Americans were virtually unable to get a formal education. There were attempts and efforts through church basements and some Quaker groups, but really a, a, a damaging impact there. Later in the Warren Court, in the Green versus County School Board of New Kent in 1968, the Supreme Court uses a phrase that is getting to this idea of uh, all deliberate speed. Because by 1964, 2% of Black students attended an integrated school. So in 1968, they say, we must uh, get to the root and branch of this issue. And finally, in 1969, the court, the Warren Court, overturns, ends its all deliberate speed in a case that dealt with Mississippi, arguing that now was the time. Essentially, throughout this whole period, I think you get the required document, Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, wait almost always means never. If we move from education to a second broader idea, education critical and important, but now we expand to larger issues of tackling the Jim Crow system here. So the woman at the top you see, that's Rosa Parks, you might recognize her. That, uh, the case of the Montgomery bus boycott was decided in court with the woman at the bottom, Aurelio Browder. Uh, 
Aurelia, Aurelia Browder's case, there were a number of cases of women kicked off buses in Montgomery, would be decided after the 381 day uh, bus boycott in Montgomery. And in that moment then, you get an idea here. The federal government, again, akin to the Marshall Court with the decision of Fletcher v. Peck and others, are telling a local system, the, school, the, the bus system in Montgomery, Alabama, one city, that it cannot deny the equal access rights to ride on that bus. Four years later, in the case of Boynton versus Virginia, the court extends its interstate uh, busing decision, decision from 1946 and applies it to the uh, uh, segregated bus terminals. Desegregating those terminals led to the testing in the sit-ins of the 60, 1960 and the, the Freedom Rides of 1961. But going case by case or issue by issue would take time. So then we get to what is known in, in the Black Freedom Struggle circles as the Child of the Storm, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And when that act was passed, its important clauses, Title II and Title VII, stand out protected classes of race, cla uh, race, uh, sex, and religion, but also Title II about employment uh, and, and hiring. So the heart of Atlanta was a, a motel that said, it's my property right to serve whom I want. You can't force me to serve someone I don't want to. And the court heard this case and will decide in a, um, uh, a powerful decision that because the heart of Atlanta had roughly 75% of its clients come from out of state, it was right off a, a freeway, that the Commerce Clause could uphold the Civil Rights Act. This is an important transformation because the Civil Rights Act of 1875 that was passed in honor to Charles Sumner, rather watered down, was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1883. Remember, that's the era where the court said the states and the states alone decide those rights. Now in 1964, in heart of Atlanta, the Supreme Court upholds the federal government being the custodian of freedom. Arthur Goldberg is pictured at top, and he writes his concurring opinion. If you recall, in that con concurring opinion, he argues that the system of Jim Crow is one that goes beyond access to hotels or hamburgers or buses, because the system of Jim Crow was a system that instilled humiliation. And what the Civil Rights Act was, he wrote, the vindication of human dignity. So we have a really interesting addition to that earlier Warren Court uh, decision of Brown. And you're getting the idea that the court itself is expanding beyond textual issues and speaking about larger issues. In my mind, it's moving away from what Dr. King called the difference between negative liberty of desegregation, banning bad law, and moving to the positive vision of the beloved community of integration, acceptance, and brotherhood that he said. And that would be the end of all isms in his mind. Uh, th that, that same year, the court decided in a case that was uh, slightly different than, than Heart of Atlanta about a barbecue uh, joint. This joint, uh, this barbecue place had very few people that would have come from out of state. So it was distinct, you couldn't use the Commerce Clause. But in this case, uh, the court asserted the right of Congress to oversee even local economic activity. Again, I see that maybe akin to Marshall and, and Fletcher v. Peck. So then if we move to the third topic, the crown jewel, Dr. King, in his comment about the need for the ballot, gives us that wonderful idea that says, without the vote, I cannot make up my own mind. It is made up for me. So we look at the idea of the, the need for voting rights, to be full and equal participants in our uh, constitutional republic here. So the parts that we recall here are the Baker v. Carr required court decision. If you remember, if we look at the electoral issues on election clauses of the Constitution, the foremost one that we consider here is Article 1, Section 4. Article 1, Section 4 will give states the power to determine election processes. 
However, Article 1, Section 4 continues that states have the right to have the manner and the means, but also Congress has the right to have some oversight. So if you remember, Cong, uh, con, uh, the states passed laws that limited, term limited, their federal representatives. That was not permissible. So states have rights, but those rights are, are maybe primary, but not absolute. So if you look at the state being primary, Congress in that clause is considered ultimate. If we ask, other constitutional parts beyond Article 1, Section 4. We certainly would cite the 10th Amendment and states' rights, but that comes up against perhaps the 14th Amendment and equal protection, and then Article 6, the Supremacy Clause. So the case of Baker v. Carr is about what is the nature of political questions? We go back then to the, the concept of the Ashwander Rules. When should a court intervene and decide an issue? When should a court decide that it's judiciable? that this is not simply a political process for legislatures. Baker v. Carr is that important case where it intervenes and says it is a case to consider. It was argued twice in 1961 and then the ruling in 1962. What it does is sets up the idea that the court can look at these voter districts and voting processes here. Reynolds v. Sims then extends the concept to one man, one vote. And finally, South Carolina versus Katzenbach would be the case that upholds the 1965 Voting Rights Act, that one that sets up uh, preclearance and some other things to consider uh, the legitimacy of um, uh, 11 states and their voting processes here. If we move from that idea, we're gonna move to uh, a fourth topic here. And this is the concept really that we have of individual liberties and civil rights here, civil liberties. So the, the, the family you see there is this beautiful, happy interracial couple. Many of you would know that this is the case, Loving versus Virginia here. So the case of Loving versus Virginia will challenge uh, a whole host of laws. Many states had for, for decades had banned interracial marriages or anti-miscegenation laws. By the time we get to the 1950s, only 16 states, I believe it was, still maintained these. And in this challenge here now, again, the right to marry is not a textual right. But the 14th Amendment use of the, the Equal Protection Clause will be used to overturn state bans on interracial marriage. But if we extend beyond that again, Warren's opinion here argues that marriage is vital to the pursuit of happiness and the very existence and survival of man. Now, if you think about that, in his opinion, the idea that the freedom to marry should be only based in the choice of the individual. Many of you get that. Many of you would agree with that, if not all of you. But the idea that it's part of the pursuit of happiness and the very existence and survival of man takes us to a higher level of thought here. That could be very well tied right next to the concept of dignity from Arthur Goldberg. The ACLU attorneys that argued the case argued that these laws were central to a part of maintaining white supremacy. And Earl Warren, in his opinion, writes that the laws that barred interracial marriage were designed for the maintenance of white supremacy. Imagine that, the first time the court references that phrase. And so you see now, it's a larger part of getting uh, away from not just law, but to a cultural revolution here. And you can see, in the period of the Warren court, few whites, at the beginning, early parts approved of this, a modest amount by 1968, and by 2015, your generation, not over 90% approve of interracial relationships here. If we extend civil liberties, we have a handful of cases here in the Warren Court. Sherbert versus Werner is a free exercise of religion case. This was a case with Adele Schwerner, who was a Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, her Sabbath thus is a Saturday. Her employer required her to work on Saturday. When she refused based on religious beliefs, he terminated her. She went to apply for unemployment benefits 
and the state denied her because she violated the work requirement here. The Supreme Court upholds her right of faith and her ability to receive those benefits. Griswold versus Connecticut, we've discussed. Griswold is another very contentious case. Griswold will establish the right of privacy. Not a textual right, not enumerated. Nowhere do you see that written there. So the case involves uh, the Planned Parenthood of Connecticut. And the director of Planned Parenthood uh, had been counseling and providing um, birth control to the clients. The pill had been introduced uh, in, in the market in 1961. And Connecticut and New York, I believe it was, were the only two states that prohibited the actual use of the pill. Other states limited the sale. But Connecticut was a bit more strict on their limits there. So this is a great case in which the choice of the written opinion, it's not just the decision that's made, but it's what's said in the opinion. Because in the discussions in conference, the justices are deciding, they, they have a super majority that agree that we should overturn this uh, uh, Connecticut law, seven to two. But there were differences on why. So one reason could have been history. So when we go back to the concept of originalism versus living, there is a set of views that says you should look at the historical context here. So Connecticut's an outlier. It's not uh, common with that. You could have argued the due process clause, as some said. You could have, as Arthur Goldberg argued, uh, argued simply the Ninth Amendment. But the writer of the opinion mattered, William O. Douglas. Douglas's opinion uses the phrase penumbra and emanations. His argument is that there are certain rights that arise out of the textual rights. So he cites the first, the third, the fourth, uh, the fifth, and the ninth amendments. And I argue, I'd add James Otis's writs of assistance. And uh, a, 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 no, a man is the king of his castle here, right? And so, uh, or man's home, he's the king of his home. Um, in that, we're getting a concept that privacy is implicit in many of our documents here. It's an idea that I think Americans believe in, but it's textual here. It's not textual here. And what I think is happening here, I've argued to you, is that you're seeing unenumerated natural rights. Now the court has cited this before. We talked about it with corporate personhood. We talked about it with economic liberty. Those are not textually written here, but they emanate out of parts of the Constitution here. The Douglas opinion then effectively creates a, a zone of privacy, an autonomy, a personhood that will be debated ever since. In the case of U.S. v. O'Brien, you find uh, a case in which a protester to the Vietnam War burned his draft card. That's a, uh, a, an offense. The court overturned it as his right to express dissent. Finally, in the case of Afroim v. Rusk, this was a case of a man who had dual citizenship in the United States and in Israel. And he left the United States and lived in Israel for a while and in fact voted in an Israeli election. In doing that, when he tried to return to the US, his citizenship was revoked under federal law. The Supreme Court overturned that, arguing that citizenship is no light trifle to be jeopardized any moment Congress decides to do so. And so what we'll see then is that the right of citizenship cannot be taken from you. You can only voluntarily renounce it. There are exceptions to that for naturalized citizens, naturalized citizens that lie in the process, but Afroim gives uh, an individual liberty and right there. At this point, I'm gonna stop this section and I will pick up with the rest of the lecture in the next video.